us with a little rainy, a little cloudy, but nevertheless another good day that the Lord has given us and we're going to rejoice uh, and be glad in it. We pray and trust that thus far you've had a wonderful day. Uh, we pray that you're having a good week and guess what I know you are because you are a child of, the God, of, of, of God and uh, there's nothing that's going to happen uh, as we move forward that God cannot handle for us provide and we don't get in his way and that's one thing we're gonna have to learn how to do is not to get in God's way put it in his hand give him the keys and let him do just what we know he's able to do I'm so excited uh, to have another opportunity to come in your presence and uh, amen move forward with this Bible study and I pray again Amen, that we're able to learn something together. Uh, you teach me as I teach you. And uh, hopefully we can learn what the Lord would have us to on this day so that we can be just a little closer to the Lord. I think the hymn writer said, just a little closer walk with thee is all I need. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you now for this evening. We thank you for your loving kindness, your tender mercies. Uh, we thank you for just being our keeper and our protector, uh, for providing us the gift of salvation through your son Jesus. And now, Father, as we make ready to embark on this Bible study journey, we just pray that you will allow your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us every step of the way. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, do allow me to acknowledge, as we did on last Wednesday, uh, this Bible study for tonight uh, is being pre-recorded, and so you won't be able to uh, call in and ask questions, but certainly we value your thoughts uh, we value your suggestions and your comments. So as I move forward, uh, don't hesitate to just come behind something I said and say, Reverend, I hear you, or however you feel like uh, you want to respond. As you know, we're in the Gospel of St. Mark. That's going to be our journey uh, for this year. And we do reserve the right uh, to take some detours every now and then if we feel like we need to deal with something else that's a lot of lot more important at that present moment. It's called, amen, current events is what it's really called. So if we come across some current events and we feel like we need to take a detour, then certainly we will. Otherwise, we're going to take our time. We got all of 2024. We're going to take our time and walk through uh, the book of Mark. Not necessarily always verse by verse, but we're going to pay attention to detail as it relates to chapter by chapter. So now let's look at St. Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Last week, we covered water baptism, the significance of it what it represents, why as Christians we ought to be excited about it and what it represents. That was last week's lesson, water baptism. Today we're going to deal with temptation. How do we deal with temptation? So let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And immediately the Spirit 
driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. So here it is. After Christ himself was baptized in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. A voice cries out from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son of whom I'm well pleased. And then verse 12 says, And immediately, straightway, the Holy Spirit leadeth him out into the wilderness and it says and Satan showed up isn't it amazing how when you give your life to Christ Satan will immediately show up and begin to try you and tempt you as long as you out in the world doing all kinds of wicked and ungodly things Satan is happy you on his team you're doing what he would have you to do but when you turn your life around and give your life to Christ and you are baptized as a open testimony that I'm giving my life to Jesus, Satan will come after you as never before. And that's what he did. He came after Jesus. But what Mark does not do in verse 12 and 13, he does not go into detail as to how Satan tempted Jesus. So here's how you and I need to learn how to study the Bible. Remember I told you last week, Mark, Matthew, and Luke are synoptic gospels. They pretty much agree with one another. They share the same stories. Sometimes one will share that story more so than the other. So that's what we're witnessing now. We are witnessing Mark telling us that after Jesus was baptized, teach, stand, I think I will, he was led into the wilderness and Satan came after him. But he doesn't go into detail. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do some cross references. So I want you to pick up your Bible even though we're studying St. Mark, and that's where we're going to be, now we're going to have to go back to the Gospel of St. Matthew. So go back to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4. Go with me to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4. And in Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we're going to see the details of how Satan attacked at Jesus. Both Matthew and Mark end it by saying, and the angels came and ministered to Christ. Mark said that in verse 13. But what Mark does not do is give us the full detail of the three temptations. So now let's take a moment and let's look at these three temptations. It says, and Jesus was in the wilderness. I'm in Matthew chapter four. And the tempter, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was hungry. And Satan came to him and said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So Satan says, well, okay, let me try him a second time. So in verse five, Satan taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of a temple and said to him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, 
and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 7. This is temptation number 2. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's the second temptation. Satan said, Man, I didn't get it with number one. I didn't get it with number two. Surely I get it with number three. So verse eight, again, again, meaning he done done it once, he done done it twice, again. The devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. So here it is. Jesus is giving us as Christians a road map of how to deal with temptation. Temptation is a inward and outward desire and craving to do something that we know we ought not be doing that's going to bring oftentimes terrible consequences. Are you listening to me? Temptation is an inward as well as an outward desire or craving to oftentimes do something that's not right. God word and already told us don't do it. But we have that desire, that fleshly desire to do it anyway, not even concerning ourselves with the consequences that might come thereafter. But watch this, children of God. Temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Temptation in and of itself. That there's a song in the Red Hymn book that says, Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Even the Apostle James said in his writing that temptation in and of itself is not sin. It is only when we are drawn away in our own appetite and do what God has told us not to do. When I think about temptations, I think about the one that Eve encountered, her and Adam in the Garden of Eden. I think about Samson and how he was overcome by the lust of Delilah, which brought about some tragic consequences. I think about David with his encounter with Bathsheba as he walked and patrolled the streets one evening and he saw this beautiful woman taking a bath uh, and it, it consumed him in so much that he sent for her. And when she made him aware of who she was and that she was a married woman, that still did not deter him, a man, from sleeping with her. So temptation in and of itself, we, we, we're going to encounter temptation in a multiplicity of ways. But the key is don't give in to it. So let's do this. Let's do this for the next few minutes. Temptation comes from three perspectives. There are three primary ways we're going to encounter temptation. Number one, Satan, because that's clearly in our text in Mark and Matthew, Satan is the initiator of these three temptations that Christ encountered. So temptation comes from Satan, Number two, temptation comes from uh, the world. We live in 
a wicked and evil world. And oftentimes, we're going to be tempted, enticed to do things that is not pleasing to God because the world is putting certain things in front of us. The world tells us what songs to enjoy. The world tells us how to dress, how to wear our clothes. The world tells us how to fix our hair. The world tells us how to party and enjoy life. And many times, these things are not in God's will. They are not things that God is, a, is, is, is a pleased with, or things that he approved. And so many times, the temptations that we encounter will come from Satan. Number two, it'll come from the world of which we live. And then number three, many times, temptation is of our own doing. It comes from within our own flesh. And I think Jesus summed it up by saying, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I heard the apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, within my flesh is no good thing, but thank God I have the spirit that helps me bring the flesh under subjection. So a lot of times, you know, temptation ain't got nothing to do with the devil. Uh, matter of fact, an uh, uh, old humorous story I heard one time by the devil was in a park one day and he was sitting on a bench just sobbing up something, talking about the devil now. And somebody walked by and recognized it was the devil. And they said, devil, why are you crying like that? He said, they blame me for everything. And so a lot of times in that humorous statement, the devil said, I get blamed for everything and he's nowhere around. I think Flip Wilson used to make us laugh years ago with his comedy hour. Oh, Flip Wilson would say, the devil made me do it. Uh, but the devil, here again, the devil can tempt you, but he can't force you to do anything. We see that right here with Jesus. He, he, he tried to entice Jesus. He tried to get Jesus, talking about the devil, to turn stones into bread because he knew Jesus was hungry. He wanted Jesus to act out of his will, act out of his father's will. It sounds, it sounds like it's really no big deal. You hungry, you have an eating in 40 days. Go ahead and turn these stones into bread. But see, everything will always lead to something else. When Satan gets you to act up one time, then he's going to try to get you to act up the third and fourth time. So Satan knew if I can just get Jesus to perform this simple miracle, I can always entice him to act out of his father's will. In other words, this act of obedience will lead to other acts of disobedience. And so what did Jesus say? He quoted the scripture and said, man should not live by bread alone. So Satan is the author of temptation. He came back a second and a third time. The world in which we live in, in and of itself, is a source of temptation. We have commercials, commercials that come on television, tempt us in all kinds of ways. Sometimes with food, sometimes with clothing, sometimes with lust for the opposite sex, or what have you. Even the commercials uh, can go into a movie and watching the wrong movie, listening to the wrong kind of music, all of that can be a tempting force. So that's the world. And then number three, Oftentimes, temptation is something that comes from within us. Satan is nowhere to be found. And I can hear Satan say, stop blaming me for your own self-induced temptations. So now that we understand the three sources of temptation, and I'm not saying they can't be others. Somebody else might teach a lesson on temptation, and they'll give you four 
sources of temptation. A five, I'm fine with that. All of us work together in the clergy, in the ministry. So now that I, I have given you three areas that temptation can come from, Satan, the world, and yourself, let's look at how we can fight off temptation. That's the key. The key is, Reverend Stanley, since we now know that all of us is going to have to deal with temptation, we know that temptation in and of itself is not a sin against God. It's only when we yield to the temptation. So, Reverend Stanley, what are some things we can do as Christians to fight off temptation so that we don't sin and have to suffer the wrath of God as well as terrible consequences? A lot of us don't realize, amen, that sin has consequences. So all of us ought to do our utmost best not to fall in sin. So the first thing we can do to help fight off temptation, let me drink a nice little swallow of this good punch. Man, that's good. The first thing, one of the things, I won't say the first, but one of the things that we can do as individual Christians to fight off temptation and leave it under our feet, under our subjection, is to stay involved in persistent prayer. Stay involved in persistent prayer. The Bible says man ought to always pray. And certainly when you find yourself being tempted about something, and you feel like it's about to overwhelm you to the point that you're going to give in to it, what a good time to fall down on your knees and to ask God to give you strength not to give in. You fall down on your knees and, and as the old people say, and have a little talk with Jesus and say, Lord, please give me the strength to fight this situation off. So persistent prayer, write that down, persistent prayer, amen, is a good way to fight off temptation. The second way that we can fight off temptation is right here in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus quoted scripture. Three times Satan came at him. And each time he came at him, he came a little harder. But Jesus was able to push him off. He was able to put him under his subjection by quoting scripture. And that's why it's important for you and I to know scriptures. No, we, we're not going to know the whole Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But if we know enough scripture, then that's going to help us uh, keep temptation from dominating us. Uh, and, and that's what Jesus did. He quoted scripture. All through the New Testament, God used those apostles to give us verses to help us deal with certain situations. God used Solomon. Uh, to give us the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes so that we could make good decisions that the Lord would have us to make and not the ones that the devil would have us to make. So if we're going to put temptation, if we're going to put it in subjection to our will, then we're going to have to learn God's word and how to quote scripture, and that'll help us fight off Satan. And then, if we don't know nothing but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, that'll help keep us sane right there. 
That helped keep us out of a lot of mess right there. The wages of sin is death. In other words, Paul was letting us know sin has terrible consequences and sometimes even death. How many times have men and women been killed in their sins, died in their sins, didn't have the opportunity to repent and make it right? And so when we do wrong, saints of God, uh, we need to understand terrible consequences can come from them sins. So quote scripture, and that'll help you overcome temptation. A third way you can fight off temptation is by surrounding yourself uh, with saved folks, with men and women who love the Lord and they have a desire to walk in obedience to God. Let me say something here. A lot of times people are saved, but they still have a desire for things that God is not pleased with. And many times if that's who you are kind of running with as a Christian, then certainly they are, their, their habits will rub off on you if you're not careful. You know, they might say, ain't no wrong with having a little fun, or, or, you know, that kind of thing. And in truth, it's not. Uh, the Bible said there's a time and a season and a place for everything. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Not everything that's good or bad, but there's a time and a place for everything good. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people don't know how to draw the line and say that's as far as I'm going you know as it relates to just being sociable just having a nice time per se and so here it is here it is here it is in Psalms number one in Psalms number one the psalmist said blessed is the man that walketh not in the count now let's go read it let's read it. I don't want to paraphrase it I don't want to just say it and not say it right. Let's go to Psalms number one, the book of Psalms. I'll give you a chance to get there. Psalms number one. We're talking about overcoming temptation by making sure you surround yourself with men and women who have a godly desire uh, to please God. All of us make mistakes, but we ought to still try to surround ourselves with men and women who are doing their best not to make as many. So look what it says in Psalms number one, verses one and three, one through three. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So there you have it. The psalmist says, blessed is the man who don't surround himself, walk, sit it, or stand in the wrong company. So that's a third way that you're going to be able to fight off temptation to do wrong is to have other godly men and women undergirding you and keeping you close to God. And lastly, number four, the fourth way you can fight off temptation is by fasting. All through the Bible, godly men and women went on fast. And sometimes the best way to deal with these temptations that's trying to overwhelm you uh, and throw your life into chaos and mess up your testimony and mess up your life and destroy your family when you feel these demonic spirits all around you trying to conquer you, 
Not only is prayer good, not only is uh, reading scripture good, not only is surrounding yourself with other good Christians, but even take it upon yourself to start fasting. And what is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from something that you normally do for a season so that you can concentrate on the power and the goodness of the law. So there we have it. That takes care of this evening's lesson, dealing with temptation. And notice what it says. It says in verse 11, after Jesus rejected the devil three times, it says the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to him. Oh, I like that. I like Matthew 4, verse 11. Satan, get thee behind me. You can't win this battle. And as Satan departed with his tail tucked between his legs, knowing he had lost that battle, then God allowed the holy angels to come and minister to Jesus. And that's what he'll do for you. When you fight off the evils of this world, the temptations of this world, the wickedness of this world, when you say, I live for God, he saved my soul, and I'm not going to give in to this stuff that others are doing, even though it looks delightful, even though it looks pleasurable, even though it looks like they're having a good time, I'm not going to be a partaker of it because I know I got a soul to save. And when you take that stand, when you take that stand against ungodliness and unrighteousness, God will send his angels, amen, to minister to your soul. God bless you. Thank you for joining us on this gorgeous Wednesday evening. I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, and my prayer is that I will be back live in the sanctuary. So if you want to come in, that's all well and good. Uh, but uh, we'll still be back uh, next Wednesday at 6.30 uh, on another journey of this virtual Bible study, the Gospel of St. Mark. God bless you. And oh yeah, one announcement, unfortunately, we did lose one of our dear members and brothers, brother who attend uh, the 7.45 a.m. worship service, uh, Brother Corey Jordan. So be in prayer for his wife, his son, his mother, his family, Corey Jordan, and we'll be giving you the date of the funeral uh, in the days to come. With that said, God bless you. Have a beautiful rest of the evening. Get some good rest tonight so that you'll be ready for tomorrow and have a great week. God bless you.